This might look like a regular bite sleeve, but it's actually a bite sleeve that I've created that accurately measures canine bite force. And this is a fully trained protection dog about to sink its teeth into it. But how did we get to this point? If you go onto Google and you type in dog bite force, you'll get thousands of results claiming different bite force pressures for different breeds. 350 PSI, 550 PSI, even numbers over 700 PSI. But here's the thing, where's the actual test? I've clicked through every link, every article, and not once have I seen anyone prove it. So are these numbers real or just repeated myths? After hours of searching, I came across this video a video originally posted in 2007 by National Geographic. They seem to be actually testing the bite force of three different dog breeds using some sort of modified bite sleeve with a handheld device attached that displays the score of each dog. The more I watched this video, the more skeptical I became. Although they're using a handheld device and a modified sleeve to display the bite force readings, we never actually get to see what's on the device and the only data we get is numbers popping up on the screen. For all we know, these numbers could be completely made up. So this gave me an idea. I was going to create my own bite sleeve that accurately measures canine bite force with all the numbers and data displayed in real time. I started doing research on different ways to measure bite force and ended up down a rabbit hole. Turns out they've attempted to measure the bite force of a saltwater crocodile, a snapping turtle, and even different species of birds. Because apparently, if it's got a mouth, someone out there has tried to get it to bite a pressure gauge. The idea I eventually came up with was to build the bite force sensor inside a bite sleeve. Since I plan on using protection trained dogs, they should, in theory, bite as hard as they can, because that's literally their job. So at this point I was feeling pretty confident about the bite sleeve and now I just had to build it. Um, you can see here I'm just doing various different things, I'm stripping wires, connecting them to the different PCBs. Here's some coding and some calibration, you can see we've got a, um, a pressure plate there which the load cell will sit inside. This will be wrapped in foam to protect the dog's teeth. Um, the worst part was definitely the soldering, I was just constantly swearing at the wires and burning myself. but. We did manage to get a semi-working prototype that should get the results. So now we had the prototype ready, we just needed to test it. Which means we would need dogs that are highly trained in bite work and personal protection. And my dogs are quite the opposite. Finding the right dogs to test our prototype wasn't going to be easy. I spent hours searching for bite work clubs and trainers who specialise in personal protection, hoping that one of them would be open to the idea. I sent out lots of emails explaining the concept, the data that I wanted to collect and how it could benefit the trainers, but at first nobody seemed interested and I didn't get any replies. It was starting to feel like a dead end. But then, finally, somebody got in touch. A trainer who was actually interested in testing our prototype on his dogs. The trainer who reached out was John Pierre from JP Man Canine, a highly respected professional in the dog training world. He's competed in world championships and trained dogs for high level protection sports all over the globe. I was excited but also a bit nervous. This wasn't just any trainer. John Pierre knows exactly what he's looking for in a bite sleeve, and his dogs are some of the best in the game. If my prototype had any weaknesses, he would notice it straight away. But this was my chance to prove that the sleeve could hold up against elite level dogs and real world training scenarios. There was no room for error, I had to make a solid first impression. With everything set, it was time to hit the road. I knew this was going to be a serious test, not just for the sleeve, but for me too. Would it work as I hoped, or would I have to go back to the drawing board? Either way, I was about to find out. Pulling into the training centre, I could feel the nerves kicking in. 
Meeting new people is one thing, but meeting experienced trainers and serious protection dogs, that's a whole different level. As soon as we got inside, the nerves kind of disappeared. JP and his team were incredibly welcoming, and within minutes, I realised that these guys weren't just professionals, they were passionate about their craft and excited to see what I'd brought to the table. Once I'd met everyone and we had everything set up, it was time to put the bite sleeve to the test. Right away, I knew this was going to be interesting. Boy. One nine two. One nine four. Two, two, four. There you are, there you are, there you are! Good boy! Give it to him, good boy, holy boy! 61. Good boy, 70! 70, go on then! One thing I really liked about this club was the wide variety of breeds. Not just Malinois and Shepherds, but some powerful and unique dogs that really put the sleeve through its paces. But things didn't exactly go to plan. First my power source kept cutting out mid-bite, which meant I was losing crucial data. Then the wires feeding my LCD screen were getting tangled around the dog's paws, which was frustrating for both them and me. And the worst part, the bite force readings made no sense. One moment a dog would hit 200 psi, and the next, the same dog biting in the exact same place would register only 80 psi. Something was definitely off. At this point, I knew I had a serious problem to solve. The concept was solid, but the execution needed work. So was this a failure and a waste of time? Absolutely not. Nothing great comes without challenges and setbacks, and this was just part of the process. The only way to improve is to learn from mistakes, adapt and come back stronger. Every problem we ran into was just another step towards making the bite sleeve better. And on the plus side, the guys at the club really enjoyed the session. They'd never seen anything like this before, and the concept behind the sleeve genuinely interested them. 64. Despite all the planning and preparation, not everything had gone to plan, but that didn't matter. What mattered was that I'd finally gotten out there, I'd met some great people, worked with some incredible dogs and gathered valuable insights. This was just the beginning. Now it was time to take what I'd learned, go back to the drawing board and make the next test even better. <laughs> After a long weekend of driving, filming and testing, I took Enzo for a walk to reflect on everything that had happened. The first real test of my bite sleeve was done, but instead of feeling satisfied, I had more questions than answers. Some things had gone to plan, but a lot hadn't. And if I wanted to improve, I needed to break everything down, what worked, what failed and what could be done better. But there was one thing I couldn't stop thinking about. Was I even measuring bite force the right way? I had spent months researching bite force statistics. I'd seen PSI used in scientific studies, media articles, and even popular YouTube videos. But after seeing the numbers I was getting, something didn't feel right. The results were inconsistent. The forces didn't match what I expected. And the more I tried to make sense of it, the more I realized I might be looking at things the wrong way. That's when it finally hit me. Is PSI even an accurate way to measure bite force? And if it's not, then why is it used so often? When people talk about a dog's bite force, they almost always mention PSI, pounds per square inch. You've probably heard it before, claims that a certain breed has a bite force of 700 PSI, 1000 PSI, or even more. These numbers get thrown around a lot, but here's the problem, most of them are completely inaccurate. PSI measures pressure, not force. It tells us how much force is applied over a specific area but it doesn't actually tell us how hard a dog is biting. Think of it this way. 
Imagine pressing your fingertip against your palm with a certain amount of pressure. Now take a sewing needle and press it against your palm with the exact same force. The needle will feel much sharper and it might even puncture the skin. But that's not because you're using more force, it's because all that force is being concentrated on a tiny point. The smaller the contact area, the higher the PSI, but the actual force behind it hasn't changed. The same thing happens with a dog's bite. A small dog with a narrow bite can technically generate a higher PSI reading than a large dog with a wider jaw, even if the larger dog is biting with much more overall force. That's why PSI is misleading. It doesn't measure the total power of the bite, just how that power is distributed. To understand how bite force should actually be measured, I started looking into scientific research studies. One of the best sources I found was the National Center for Biotechnology Information, where researchers have conducted real-world bite force tests using working dogs. One study in particular stood out. It was conducted in Finland using Finnish police dogs. At first, the researchers attempted to measure bite force in PSI, recording pressure from individual teeth, but they quickly ran into a major problem. The shape of the dog's mouth, the positioning of the teeth, and the way each dog bit down all caused huge variations in the PSI readings. Some teeth would make stronger contact than others. Some bites would shift mid-test and even slight changes in jaw placement would throw off the results. Because of this, they realized that PSI wasn't a reliable way to measure bite force in dogs. Instead, they focused on measuring total force, recording it in kilograms and newtons. By doing this, they were able to get a consistent reading of how much force the dog was actually applying without it being distorted by individual tooth placement or pressure distribution. This study confirmed what I'd already started to realize. If you want an accurate bite force measurement, you need to measure total force, not pressure. And that completely changed the way I approached the testing. Anyway, that's enough of the technical talk for now, because in the next episode, I make major changes to the bite scheme when we finally answer the big question, how hard can a dog actually bite? Trust me, you don't want to miss this.